Okay. Okay. Let's talk about our first type uh, of optimization algorithm. So something uh, that's really fundamental to the course um, and is really sort of straightforward to describe, a direct search algorithm. So before I talk about it, um, let's have a little chat quickly about what makes a good algorithm. So I'm going to talk about algorithms a lot uh, in this course. Um, you know, and there's a number of different ways for you to um, decide what you think is a good um, optimization algorithm. So there's another of, um, a number of criteria that make something a good optimization algorithm. So firstly, you might have to do a small number of operations. So for a computer, the less amount of times you have to repeat something, you have to do some operation um, and, uh, and use the computer, use energy in the computer, that's good. Um, so that uh, makes the algorithm good. Um, yeah, you might be able to parallelize the algorithm. Um, so there might be uh, steps that you can do simultaneously. So if you had multiple CPUs um, or multiple machines, uh, you might be able to throw them all um, sort of brute forcely uh, in parallel uh, at your problem um, and get it to solve. And that would be useful as well, being able to use lots of computers in parallel. Um, yeah, uh, there are trickier things. So if you, you know, the more you know about uh, how computers work, um, you know, you um, know that there's a difference between using the CPU uh, and actually using memory. Um, so, you know, um, computers these days have these very fast uh, CPUs, um, you know, graphics cards and things like this that can do computations uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and actually writing things, you know, using the cache, um, uh, writing things into memory is where data has to be transferred between bits of the computer and where things can slow down. So um, you might want to maximize the amount of operations that you can do in place just using the CPU and not have to uh, write to the, um, you know, write to memory. So, you know, my, um, uh, my Mac laptop has this problem um, where it's like it's got a little bit of, uh, it's got a, a decent CPU um, and it claims to ha have a lot of memory that it can use because it can write stuff to the disk and it can um, use the disk to um, have so much virtual memory. Um, and it sounds great. It sounds like it can do, can do lots of things um, in there. But um, in truth, you know, it's very, very slow for data to get written to the hard drive. It chews up bits of the, um, the slow hard drive when it, act when it actually uses um, that virtual memory. And so the whole machine runs to a, uh, runs to a, a grinds to a halt. And so the fact that it's got a fast CPU um, doesn't really matter um, because it's always writing stuff to disk, which is annoying. Uh, yeah, and then, you know, something we won't talk about, um, but which is super important, uh, is the human time that it takes to write code. So, you know, um, I'll show you a bunch of algorithms uh, here, many of which will be not optimized, which will be sort of um, uh, have uh, lots of for loops and things like this in them. There are more efficient ways to write uh, many of the codes that I'll show you uh, in this course, um, but it takes time uh, and brain cycles. Uh, to think about how to optimize a code and how to uh, write it efficiently, um, yeah, and you know that's something to uh, that's something to consider. Uh, so we could talk about all of these things, and we will talk about all of these things in various uh, bits and pieces throughout the course. So this will be pretty uh, practical. Um, teach you a little bit about programming, hopefully, throughout the course. Uh, for simplicity, um, I'll spend most of my ta time talking and proving results and things uh, about calculating the number of times that the objective function, so the f of x, um, gets called. Because that's, A, because it's easy to calculate that, um, and it's sort of where the, uh, most of the grunt, uh, most of the work for the computer um, gets done. So, OK, let's talk about our first class of problems. Uh, and that's going to be bounded, uh, bounded fun problems. So the first thing that I'll talk about um, is a unimodal uh, bounded problem. So what do I mean by unimodal? Um, you know, if you've done statistics, you know that uh, a, a distribution that is unimodal means something that's got one peak, right? Uh, whereas bimodal has got two, has got two peaks, two modes. Um, it means something that's maybe sort of related here, uh, but not exactly the same. So a unimodal function will mean one that has got one minimum. So I'm going to assume to start off with 
um, that my problems are going to have one minimum um, rather than many um, local minima. Also, I'll always talk about minimizing functions uh, in this course rather than maximizing just because um, that lets me draw because all the pictures in the book look like this. Um, but I can talk about maximizations by um, take, looking at negative f of x whenever I do this. So a unimodal function is this. Uh, a multimodal function is something with many local maxima rather than just one, uh, local maxima and local minima, um, rather than just one. OK. So here's the first problem uh, that we're going to look at. And it's this. Find the minimizer uh, of the unimodal function f. Uh, and so f is going to uh, exist on some interval. So it's going to be bounded. Um, so it's going to map from a to b. So the bounded interval a to b to the real numbers. You know, so it's going to look like a curve um, uh, sitting above some interval a, b, um, where I assume nothing about the differentiability of f. So this, can, um, this function can have spikes in it. Um, it can have gaps in it. Um, it can have little points uh, where the derivative doesn't exist. Um, all that I'm going to assume is that it's got one single minimum. OK. And now, you know, this is actually quite a broad, a pretty broad class of functions, right? When you've done um, optimization as a calculus problem at school, um, you would have um, you know, assumed that everything's dif differentiable. But I'm not going to do that here. OK, so let's talk about this quickly. Using a piece of paper, I've got to move the piece of paper to the correct position. So I'll just wave here for the moment to the people at home. I would have done this on the whiteboard and let you see my face, um, but the camera is not working. So you can see my hand, uh, and I'll reveal my face to you um, sort of soon, I guess. So okay, so let's let's sketch out what we mean. So what we're looking at here uh, is a function uh, that is defined on the interval a, b, right? So it's bounded, um, and it just exists somewhere. So it, is, it has got one mode, um, but I'm not going to say anything else about it. It's just got to be differentiable. Now, how would you solve such a thing? Well, you know, how would you um, find the interval? So the, the, the idea of a bounded search is going to be um, to reduce down this interval, right, um, a, B, to something smaller here, right? So instead of saying that the minimum is somewhere um, in the interval A, B, I want to say that it's in something smaller. So let's say um, I know uh, F of A. I'm going to have to calculate F of A, and I have to calculate F of B at some point. And then I don't know where the, in where the uh, minimum uh, is here. I just know that it's somewhere between those two points. So to make some progress here, if I can't differentiate this function, all I can do is evaluate the function. I better pick somewhere else. Right? So let's pick a point uh, somewhere in between, p, and let's calculate f of p. Right? And let's say it's there. And so then the question is, does that tell me anything? Does that uh, help narrow down where the minimum of this function is. So, you know, can I say that the minimum of this function now is either between AP, is in A to P, or is between P to B? And the answer is no, right? That's not actually given me any useful information here because my function could do something like this. You know, it could go down like that. I'm draw I'll draw this function as smooth, but it doesn't have to be. Remember, it can be pointy. I'm just going to, um, it could, it just needs to have one minimum. So the minimum of this function could be there, in which case, you know, it could be between P and B, could be in the interval PB. But something that's also consistent with this would be you know, something that looks like that. And so long as I draw that so that it's unimodal, you know, in this case, um, the minimum there would be between A and P. So I can't say uh, whether the minimum is in either of those two intervals. So just evaluating somewhere in between um, doesn't give me enough information. But if I take another point Q, 
um, then that might give me more information. So let me redraw this picture. So here's A, here's B. Let's say that F of A was there. Uh, let's put F of B up here. We'll say F of P. F of P was there. If I also draw uh, F of Q in here, well, F of Q might be there, right? So if F of Q is there, then now I can say something. Now I, I can um, say something. If I know that this function is unimodal, you know, uh, know that it's, um, it's only got one minimum, well, I don't know whether the minimum is uh, between A and P or if it's between P and Q, right? But the fact that this is, F of P is the lowest point that I have, I now know that the minimum can't be between Q and B. Right? Because if it, if it did, then this would have to turn around and go somewhere lower than f of p, which would make it um, multimodal. So from this picture, there's, you know, this is the most important um, uh, insight uh, of this whole week, really, and this teaches us how to do dichotomous search. Um, you know, if I can now say, that having calculated two points, that if f of p is less than f of q, then that tells me that the minimum x star uh, has got to be between a and q. So I've got something better, right? So if I can evaluate my function at two interior points here, uh, I can now say that the minimum has to be in that interval rather than between q and b. So I've narrowed down the interval where that minimum can be. Uh, and similarly, you know, if, if this was the other way around, if f of, if f of q uh, was less than f of p, then that would have told me you know, the reverse thing. Then x star, the minimum here, would have been between p and b. So, and if I have that, um, maybe I'll draw that picture down here. So if f of a is there, f of b can be here. Let's put f of p there. And let's say f of q is lower. And that tells me that now the minimum must be somewhere in that interval. I still don't know if it's between p and q or q and b, but I know it can't be between a and p. And so that um, is the key uh, that's the key insight here. Um, and from that, we can actually come up with a dichotomous search. Uh, we can come up with a dichotomous search method, uh, which will help us out. Stop.